today we'll be having a full and in-depth discussion about the application of successor chapter rules in the game of 40k. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, the strategy and tactics focused 40k channel where we're all about trying to get the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. Now from Codex Space Marines successor chapters got a whole host of interesting and varied new rules that have only grown more interesting with the addition of the supplement books and Games Workshop's other recent releases. To newer players, the successor chapter rules I don't think are particularly well written, and even to more experienced players, I've still recently learned some new things about how successor chapters can gain you additional benefits to your army, particularly in relation to Forge World characters. In this video we'll go over the rules for using successor chapters briefly, their benefits and drawbacks, a look at some of the book's key successor traits and which ones are best, we'll be focusing particularly on the Master Artisans and Stealthy combo, and finally talk briefly about Forge World characters in successor chapters. So that's quite a bit to be getting on with, so let's get started. Firstly, let's just quickly go over the successor chapter rules again. In Codex Space Marines, if you're not nominating yourself to be one of the main chapters, that's something like Ultramarines, White Scars or Iron Hands, then you can declare yourself a successor chapter. There's a list of traits that you can pick from, from the main Space Marine rulebook. You get to pick two of them, unless you pick Inheritors of the Primarch, which basically just clones the standard chapter tactic from the primary chapter that you have chosen to be a successor of. So say, for example, if I was playing my own successor chapter, the Blood Eagles, I could declare that they were a successor chapter of the Salamanders, for example. Pick my favourite two traits to use with them. Say, for example, the tried and tested Master Artisans and Stealthy combination. And from there, you'd also be able to access a lot of the other rules for the Salamanders. If I had an entirely pure army of my Blood Eagles Salamander successors, I'd be able to use the Salamander's unique boosted tactical doctrine to give them plus one to wound with Melters and Flamers in the army. You do get to use their specific boosted doctrine, even if you're a successor chapter, and you don't have to pick the Inheritors of the Primarch successor trait. You can if you want, but it's certainly not mandatory. I've seen that that was something that's confusing quite a lot of players before as well as access to the Doctrine, you'll also be able to make use of the majority of the rules from the Salamander Supplement Codex. You'll be able to use any of their Warlord traits, any of their stratagems unless otherwise stated in the stratagem, any of their unique Psychic Discipline to give your Salamander successors access to the Promethean Discipline, and some of the Relics. The way that the Relics work for the Supplement Codexes, such as the Salamander's one, is that there's a higher tier of Salamander's unique relics, and then a lower tier of special issue war gear. You can freely take any of these special issue war gear from the Codex, which includes things like the Adamantine Mantle, the Mastercrafted Weapon, and usually some unique bolts for bolt weapons. You'll be able to take exactly one of the relics from the Salamander's only relics, and you'd have to pay one command point for the privilege of being able to do so. So it is a little bit more restrictive, particularly if there were a couple of relics in that higher tier section that you wanted to run. But that's the trade-off for getting to pick your own successor traits. The other major trade-off is that you won't be able to use any of the Salamander's unique characters, such as Vulcan Hestan and Adrax Agatone. So you are locked out of those particular characters, but it will allow you access to any of the Forge World special characters whose successor chapters don't have clear genetic lineage. But we'll come back to those later. In general, the decision you need to make is to weigh up whether getting your own choices of chapter traits is worth the downside of losing access to those unique special characters and having harder access to the higher tier of relics that are unique to that chapter and you'd have to buy in one with a stratagem if you wanted one. Just to clarify, you can only be a successor chapter from some Space Marine chapters and you can't from others. You can be the standard six from the main rulebook the Ultramarines, White Scars, Raven Guard, Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Imperial Fists. You cannot, however, be a successor chapter of either the Crimson Fists or the Black Templars, despite these two being listed alongside the aforementioned chapters most of the time in the main rules. That's because they already are successor chapters themselves of the Imperial Fists. The Crimson Fists are, of course, alongside the Imperial Fists in their Supplement Codex, and they get their own Warlord traits and relics to pick from as well. But it is interesting that you can't be a successor of the Black Templars, as it means that if you want their unique doctrine, Knights of Sigismund, you'll just have to field your army as actual Black Templars and use their chapter trait. You can nominate to be a successor chapter of the Blood Angels or Dark Angels, but if you do so, you can't use the successor chapter custom traits from the main Space Marine Codex, as they're completely separate to the Dark Angels and Blood Angels main codexes. 
So if you're a Blood Angel successor, you'll be using Red Thirst, and if you're a Dark Angel successor, you'll be using Grim Resolve. The Blood Angels already have one successor in their rulebook, which are the Flesh Tearers, who, quite similar to the Crimson Fists, get a slightly altered chapter tactic, and some unique Warlord traits, relics, and stratagems, but at the cost of not having the standard Red Thirst, being locked out of the Blood Angels relics, as not having access to the Blood Angels character options, which are very strong indeed. My summary is that there's usually no point in actually being a successor chapter of Blood Angels or Dark Angels. As far as I can tell from a rules point of view, the only reason that you'd want to be a Blood Angels or Dark Angels successor is if you wanted to use one of those Forge World characters we mentioned that doesn't have a clear genetic lineage for their chapter, such as, say, for example, using Tyberos the Red Wake, who is the chapter master of the Carcharodons, and you could declare that they're representing a Blood Angel successor, allowing him to get the plus one to charge, access to the Doctrine, and plus one to wound on the first round of close combat, all of which Tybros would like very much. The same ruling applies to any of the other Forge World characters who don't have a stated chapter successor out of one of the main chapters. To my knowledge, this includes chapters such as the Raptors chapter, the Minotaurs, and the Carcharodons. There may well be others, so please let me know down in the comments if you know more. I really need to look into these Forge World character series a little bit more in depth in the near future. There are chapters that you can't be successor chapters of, however. We've already mentioned that you can't be one from the Black Templars and Crimson Fists. Obviously you can't from the Flesh Terrors either. And interestingly enough, you can't be a successor of the Space Wolves. They don't have any rules for it. I think the Space Wolves don't really have successors, they just have their great companies. So at least at present, rules-wise, you can't be a successor chapter from the Space Wolves. I'll certainly be interested to see if they change that at all. In the new Psychic Awakening book, I believe Saga of the Beast will be coming out sometime in March, but I wouldn't be too surprised if they don't if it doesn't fit with their fluff. As well as this, you can't be a successor chapter of the Grey Knights or Death Watch either, just in case anyone was unclear. So now we've talked a little bit about the benefits and drawbacks of successor chapters. What are my favourite traits from the Space Marine Codex? I did cover these in a previous video, back when I was first starting the channel, but we'll go back for a recap now. There's a lot of ones that I'd consider largely duds that I wouldn't pick, so we'll just briefly run through those. Stoic is a leadership buff to Space Marines who already have great leadership, so it isn't entirely powerful. Fearsome Aspect is minus one leadership within three inches. Not terrible, but at best it's only going to cause a couple of morale casualties over a whole game, and some armies just won't care about it at all. Indomitable will only affect wound rolls of 2 when you're being shot by a weapon that's over double your toughness and is only a small durability buff in the best of circumstances. Warded gives a 5 plus feel no pain against mortal wounds, a fairly decent durability boost against these, but because it doesn't actually come up at all in some matchups means that it's just drastically different in power game on game which isn't very reliable. Knowledge is power is really good for librarians, but just has the main downside that it only affects one or two models in your whole army. So I prefer something that will actually buff each one of your units rather than just one or two of them. Inheritors of the Primarch, I would only use this if I wanted to combine one of the main Space Marine chapter traits, such as Iron Hands or Imperial Fists, for example, with being able to run one of those Forge World characters that we were talking about. Otherwise, you're better off just counting your army as Ultramarines and not bothering with successor chapter rules. Stalwart is actually the one where 1 and 2 wound rolls fail. Sorry, I got that confused with Indomitable. Indomitable is having no more than one model fleet to morale each turn from each unit, and again is a leadership buff to an army that doesn't really need it for the most part. Rapid Assault is when you get no penalty for advancing and shooting assault weapons. It's not terrible, but you're probably better picking up something else that will actually buff your damage or defense, and taking that advance and shoot penalty when you absolutely need to advance, and just moving normally most of the time. Preferred Enemy gives full reroll to hits against one chosen Xenos race or Heretic Astartes. The main downside is that you have to select this as part of building your list, meaning that your chapter will only be ever any good against that one race, so you'll be incredibly good when you're fighting that matchup, but you'll get no benefit from it most of the time. Born Heroes gives you the Space Wolf 6-inch heroic intervention for characters. It's not awful, occasionally it will happen, but it's very easily countered by your opponent by just not letting your models finish up within 6 inches, and if they finish up within 3 inches, then you're not, not getting anything more out of it than a heroic intervention anyway. Duelists will give your marines a auto wound on a 6 when they're fighting infantry and bikes, which isn't too bad, but it is limited to one target, and it's generally going to be worse than Whirlwind of Rage, so I'm not really that big a fan. 
so now we start to get into the ones that are a bit more interesting to me. Bolt of Fuse Lads will give you reroll hit rolls of 1s for bolt weapons, which is a decent, reliable firepower buff. And of course, bolt weapons are usually everywhere in a Space Marine army. I think this is a really solid pick. The only question will be if you could replicate the same effects just by having a captain around. In particular though, it's a decent damage output for independent operating units that might be throwing themselves up the board to get objectives, and this will give their firepower a bit more of a sting. Tactical Withdrawal is part of the White Scars main chapter trait. It's the bit that allows them to fall back and then still charge the next turn. Now this is actually a surprisingly solid benefit for a close combat army. It's not a direct damage buff like some, but knowing that all of your marines in close combat are going to be able to go wherever they want if your opponent doesn't kill them in the next turn is a really big advantage and can make a massive headache for your opponent. The only caveat I'd have for this one is that if I was picking this as part of a successor chapter trait, I'd be very tempted just to pick up the White Scars full chapter trait as advancing and charging is a really nice bonus and the two synergize quite well and you can't get advance and charge as a successor chapter trait. It's a similar sort of story for Scions of the Forge. Scions of the Forge is part of the Iron Hands trait. It's the bit where vehicles count as having double the amount of wounds left for purposes of the vehicle damage table. If you're running a massive mechanized gun line, then this will actually be a really solid bonus and could well be worth a look to keep your tanks moving and accurate at full capacity for the majority of the game. Again though, if you are picking this up as a successor chapter tactic, I'd be very tempted to instead just take the full Iron Hands trait, as having a 6 plus feel no pain type save that Iron Hands have, as well as better overwatch is a really potent combo, and is certainly a solid competition to any one successor chapter trait. Still though, I could definitely see this combined with something like Stealthy or Master Artisans. So now we get into the very top tier, the ones that I think that are flat out competitive, and I've seen people run at tournaments. First up is Long Ranged Marksman. An extra 3 inch range could really be a big deal, and it comes up the most when you're deep striking units into your enemy lines and you're shooting them with things like flamers. In particular, the very competitive Raven Guard Assault Centurion Deep Strike Squad that comes in from reserve, firing hurricane bolters off everywhere, can now also get their 12d6 flamer shots in range if you pick up long range marksmen. It's a similar story for things like salamanders, say if you have a drop pod full of stern guard veterans or toting combi flamers, then you can absolutely douse the enemy in holy fire, and potentially use some of the other buffs and synergies that salamanders have to offer. As well as these big punches, this will also help you out just generally throughout your whole army. Having a bit of extra range will often be the crucial difference between which targets you can select. It won't come up every time something shoots, but for anything that's got something like a 24 to 36 inch range, I think you'd be surprised just how often an extra 3 inch on top of that might allow you to distribute your firepower better. Next we have Master Artisans itself, this was my favourite when the book came out, and it absolutely remains my favourite now. Master Artisans is the Salamander style rerolls, this allows each squad to reroll one hit and reroll one wound roll whenever they either shoot or fight. Now the value of this just cannot be understated, this trait will buff your damage output for every single action that any of your squads do on any turn throughout the game, due to having a higher chance to hit and wound. It's going to be the most powerful on any unit with a small amount of shots. For example, if you have a unit that just fires one last cannon, you essentially have four rerolls to hit and wound with that one weapon, which is just absolutely nuts. Though in general, Master Arsans is still really powerful on anything with something like six shots or less, and it still definitely chips in damage on bigger units with more shots. Things that love Master Arsans include twin last cannon Razorbacks, Eliminator squads, Smash Captains with their Thunder Hammers, Tactical squads toting one heavy weapon in the backfield, Vindicators, the list just basically goes on and on. If you're ever in doubt for a successor chapter tactic to pick, I would strongly recommend this one. The amount of extra damage you get over the course of a game is just obscene, and I've used it to good effect in a couple of tournaments myself. Coming down slightly from those heady heights, but still very good traits, we go on to Whirlwind of Rage. This is the one where you get double the amount of hits for every 6 that you score in the first round of melee combat. Now this equates to basically a 25% increase in melee damage, which is very powerful indeed. It synergizes nicely with Shock Assault, as both this and Shock Assault apply in the first round of combat, and it will just make your Space Marines hit like trucks. Any army that's pursuing a mainly melee strategy, whether that's deep striking assault terminators or vanguard veterans, or having a bunch of fighty characters run up the table will absolutely love this. In terms of a pure damage output perspective though, I would definitely think whether or not you could sub it out for Master Artisans if you have a choice between the two. 
The thing is that Master Artisans also gives you a very significant close combat damage boost, as well as buffing all of your shooting as well. So in my mind, in the competitive game, you need to have an absolute load of melee units to actually justify using this over Master Artisans. Although, of course, if you want to have the ultimate melee damage output, you could have both. Next we come to Stealthy. This one is part of the Raven Guard trait, and it's the one that gives all units a cover save if they're being shot by an enemy unit that's at least 12 inches away. Space Marines having a 3-up armor save already profit a lot from having the benefit of cover as they go up to 2-up saves. Against small arms fire with no AP, this will actually double their survivability going from a 3 to a 2-up. It's also really good for any of your 2-up save units, particularly when they're being shot by heavy weapons. For example, a Terminator with a 2-up save will still be saving on a 4-up even when he's shot by a LAS cannon if you have the benefit of Stealthy. In particular, I think Stealthy is really strong for mainly vehicle armies, as vehicles often struggle to get cover saves, compared with their infantry counterparts who can just loiter in the ground floor of ruins and things. In particular, this is great on flyers, who almost never manage to get a cover save, and is a really strong durability increase on these. Now, there are a growing number of chapter traits and tricks that you can use to ignore cover. Imperial Fist Space Marines are probably foremost among these, though there are also Eldar Custom Craft Worlds that can ignore cover too. Chaos Space Marines Iron Warriors, and the numbers generally growing as more releases come out. So this does have the option of being hard countered if your opponent does use one of those armies, but still against the vast majority of the field, this will be a very nice flat increase to durability that will really take the wind out of your opponent's shooting. Finally we have the trait Hungry for Battle, which is a nice uncomplicated plus one to advance and charge. The Blood Angels now have this as part of Red Thirst. Again this is a really solid pickup for any close assault army, particularly those that are thinking about charging out of deep strike to make the odds just a little bit better of making that charge, as an 8 is a lot easier to roll on 2 dice than a 9. In particular, I think this pairs well with Whirlwind of Rage to make a very deadly, very reliable charging close combat army, and I've seen this used quite a bit with those assault centurions that the Raven Guard and White Scar's successors like to use, so they can drop in, flame away with their flamers, and then make a much more reliable charge to put those siege drills to good work on something else. So those are my top chapter traits. In particular, I think it's pretty easy to see why Master Artisans plus Stealthy has become the go-to option if you're unsure in the meta, and you're just playing Space Marines as a fairly gunline-centric army, particularly if you're using a decent amount of vehicles or flyers. Master Artisans is a flat damage increase to everything forever, and Stealthy is a powerful durability increase, not quite as universal, but it does apply to the majority of enemy armies. After this, you have to consider what parent chapter you want to be running these traits for. We've discussed what the options are previously. In my experience, the successor chapters that people tend to be wanting to go for are White Scars, Raven Guard, and Iron Hands, because each of these have a decently powerful doctrine, or useful relics, strats, or warlord traits that really add a lot to your army. I'd say Iron Hands is one of the most common that we tend to see. Their Augmented Devastator Doctrine, allowing flat re-roll ones for all heavy weapons wherever they are on the board, and also moving and shooting for no penalty on heavy weapons, are two enormous simple buffs to your firepower. It combines incredibly well with Master Artisans and Stealthy, giving you high mobility, tons of re-rolls, and decent durability on basically your entire army. If you look at tournaments, these guys are one of the most commonly used successor chapter variants that you'll see competitive players using. I've been using this myself a little bit, including winning a local tournament with it recently. I'm afraid it really does just feel like playing 40k on easy mode. I wouldn't be surprised if Games Workshop does something to break this little combo in the spring FAQ, and honestly I think it would be a good move on their part for game balance if they did. The next most common successor chapter I tend to see is Raven Guard mainly for the combination of deep striking, centurions and aggressors, with the other benefits that these successor traits can bring, whether it's Master Artisans, Whirlwind of Rage, Hungry for Battle, or Long Range Marksmen. They're all pretty good for these guys, and the Raven Guard Unique Doctrine is kind of helpful as well, allowing them to assassinate characters just that bit better. White Scars are also one that I've seen people using as successors a lot, this time mainly for their psychic powers and stratagems. They also have a similar outflank type rule to the Raven Guard, meaning that you can pop down a massive unit of centurions or aggressors very close to the enemy lines, and White Scars can also make some of the fightiest characters in the game, particularly when you combine their super doctrine that gives them plus one damage, with other buffs like Master Artisans and Whirlwind of Rage. If you add that to their decent warlord traits and relics, then you get 
characters that are pretty much without match in terms of damage output in all of 40k for their points. A quick word on the others as well. Ultramarine successors I've seen occasionally, but not as consistently. Signs of Gulliman is a decent doctrine, but I think it just tends to be a bit overshadowed by the Iron Hands one, which you get turn one and you get to stay in Devastator doctrine for. Salamander's successors I've certainly seen. In particular, the combo with long range marksmen and flamer and melter weapons is a really nice synergy, and you can keep their Master Artistan's rerolls as well if you'd like. Imperial Fist successors I have seen lists running them, but I've never seen someone use them as an actual event. I think the main reason for this is that the Imperial Fist chapter trait is actually really quite strong. Their buffed bolters are better than the Bolter Fuse Lars trait, and their ability to ignore cover is a good anti meta choice at the moment with Marines running around particularly as a lot of marines are using stealthy, so Imperial Fists are quite good at countering successor chapters to be honest. Having said that, I could easily see combining the standard Master Artisans and Stealthy with their rule to add plus one to damage against all vehicles to give themselves some truly apocalyptic firepower, particularly when they're taking down tanks. So we've covered quite a lot there. Let me know any of your thoughts or experiences with successor chapters, or if there are any key strategies that I've missed off with this video. If you'd like to hear more from Auspex Tactics, feel free to subscribe. I release new 40k content every single day. Feel free to support my Patreon page as well if you'd like, as these videos do take a long time to make, and it's to really help me get to become a bit more of a full-time YouTuber, rather than just doing it in weekends and evenings. Of course, a massive thank you to my current patrons for helping make this possible. Thanks again for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.